Before we start getting some questions, why don't you, it was your first term, if I, right? That's so, correct. So, um, so, you know, why don't you talk about your perspective, uh, learning curve in the first term, and, and what you see as particular accomplishments, uh, you know, despite being in the minority party. Right. Well, um, what is that Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times? It was very interesting. I mean, in some ways, because I had nothing to which to compare it, it was, is this the norm? But then I had other legislators telling me, no. Um, on the plus side, I'm, I must say, um, compared to prior sessions, Speaker Arasimowitz was good to his word. We started on time. We tried to finish on time. Uh, you know, the last week, you're there till 2 or 3 in the morning. There has to be a better way to do this. It's just... You are flooded with bills as they try and get everything through. You're desperately trying to read the bill, the supporting testimony from the public hearing, the amendments, and then the words that strike terror in your heart. Mr. Speaker, the clerk has in his hand an amendment, and it's a strike-all amendment. So it's something that has nothing to do with the underlying bill that someone thinks I'm going to swap this in at the last minute so it could be a bill about I don't know funding the parks and all of a sudden it's about providing tax relief to a yacht club in you know so that in itself was a real learning experience it, seeing how the sausage is made and trying to be productive. I, mean, I take this position very seriously. I mean, the, the voters of East Lyme and Salem have entrusted me to represent their best interests. So I want to make sure when I'm voting on something, be it in committee or in the chamber, that I know what I'm voting on that I know what the implications are as far as possible. And when you look at the, I can't remember, the huge number of bills that were presented in the first session, because that's the session in which legislators can propose you know, their ideas. I mean, it's in the thousands. Now, it does get whittled down, but I think in this short session, 551 pieces of legislation were passed. Now, not all of them are earth-shaking, but if you're, if you're trying to do your job, that gets tough sometimes. I really, um, I enjoyed the committee work. I like being able to delve into a subject. My three committees are finance, revenue, and bonding, energy and technology, and higher education and employment advancement. Why anybody would serve on appropriations, I don't know. God love Paul for me. <laughs> and Kathleen McCarty and all those, because you basically live up there. But I, I finance revenue and bonding because it handles, you know, the taxation side, um, seeing what ideas were presented there, having you know, Commissioner of Revenue Services present. That was all very interesting. Obviously, with the issue of her millstone, being on energy and technology, I felt was very important and where I felt I played a big role, um, particularly in the House and ensuring that that legislation passed that allowed them to bid mm -hmm. in that zero carbon auction. Yeah, I, I don't need to tell you just how important that is as an asset, not only to the region in terms of jobs, in terms of economic impact, but in terms of just keeping the lights on. You know, a source of more than 50% of our electricity, 95% of our carbon-free power. We don't reach these new, very aggressive um, greenhouse gas goals if it goes away. So I, that was one, a committee I really enjoyed, and two, where I felt my work both in the committee and on the floor of the House were incredibly valuable to the region. And I have a large number of constituents in both East Lyme and Salem who work there, who are retirees. In fact, there are a number who used to work at the Kiwani plant in Milwaukee that Dominion closed. Um, so that I enjoyed that. Um, my other committee is Higher Education and Employment Advancement. I was very proud that I actually introduced a bill that was signed into law by the governor that would set about a process to create a website so Connecticut students and their parents 
could go online. I, I want to go to Central. I want to be an engineering major. And you would be able to see the cost, um, what your financial aid options are, and if you stayed in Connecticut, what you could expect to earn after five, ten years. Um, there's a collaboration between um, higher ed and Department of Labor called P20WIN that collects all that data, but it's not easy to access. And I think in this day and age, particularly with the high student loan debt, it's more critical than ever that students and their parents know not only the cost of a college education, but to be frank about it, what the payoff is likely to be. Um, when is that supposed to roll out? Uh, they're, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the implementation. They're working on it um, with P20WIN, and I am following up on that. So I would hope in the next couple of years. It was modeled on something called um, MyTexas.com. Texas has something similar, as do Virginia and I believe Michigan. A sort of one-stop shopping if you're a prospective student in, for higher education. Uh, I, the other part of that committee is workforce advancement. And again, I think that's key for all of the state, but particularly in our region where for so long we lagged behind the rest of the country in terms of recovery from the recession. I think at one point the Norwich New London area was actually ninth worst recovery in the nation. Not Connecticut, not New England, the entire nation. I'm, I'm pleased to say that, uh, as, as I mentioned before, I was at the board meeting of the Eastern Workforce Investment Board, and John Beauregard, who does such a fabulous job there, uh, presented some statistics that actually make us look pretty good. Uh, since 2015, I guess, um, GDP and employment growth in the U.S. has been 5.9 percent. Unfortunately, in Connecticut, it's been 1.8 percent. Norwich, New London is at 4.6 percent. So that's huge. Uh, getting back to the education piece, it's important for young people who don't want to immediately go to college to know there are really good employment opportunities out there. Uh, with the Eastern Workforce Investment Board, they work closely with not only the Connecticut Department of Labor, but also um, the U.S. Department of Labor with the major manufacturers. Uh, Electric Boat has representation. Um, Three Rivers, the community colleges have representation. Uh, there are a couple of new board members who were auditioning this morning, um, one from Millstone, one from um, Nancy Kauser from Sector. So they try and reach uh, across not only the major manufacturers, but also the smaller ones. Chris Jewell of Collins & Jewell is the chair and are working with not only DOL, um, but also tech schools, community colleges to create that workforce pipeline and funnel people, young men, young women. They also take uh, veterans returning, people who've been out of the workforce for a long time, and put them into those good paying careers that pay the kind of money where you can buy a house, raise a family. And when you look at the numbers of people retiring and the fact that we have to replace them, I was talking to Chris Jewell this morning, he says they've hired 10, I guess they employ 70 people, They've hired 10 from the workforce pipeline. He said for the first time in years, the average age of their employees is dropping because they're hiring young people and they're able to perform at the level they want. So that, I mean, those are the things that I've really found compelling and representing the district. I try, you know, my day job, I'm executive director of the Children's Museum, so I have a lot of interaction with local community, um, parents, young children, grandparents, and it's very rewarding to be able to talk to them, find out what their concerns are, and then go up and try to address some of that in Hartford. I was very proud that we were able to work together and produce that bipartisan budget that prevented those draconian cuts that the governor was going to make in terms of funding for education, in terms of municipal funding, that we were able to restore the money for the Medicare savings program. You know, Connecticut had a very generous definition of who was eligible. It was t twice the federal poverty level, but to go overnight from that to just 
the regular poverty level and cut over 100,000 people off of that. And we're talking low-income seniors. Um, we were able to restore the money for that. We were able to restore the money for the renter's rebate program. We have a couple of the uh, AHEPA, the low-income housing that the American Hellenic Society sponsors in our district and Senator Famica and I had several meetings with them because there was there was big concern if you're a low-income senior and you all of a sudden you had to find that 134 140 150 dollars a month to pay for your Medicare that was a big that was a big worry so that that was a great achievement um, with your experience being up there in you know, a couple of years do, do you think Mr. Stefanowski's plan to gradually repeal the income tax is a realistic uh, budgetary goal? I think it's a good aspirational goal. I think if we even reduced it by half, it would be a good sign. I know Tennessee, as of 2021, will have completely phased out their income tax. And if you look at what's happened in Connecticut since the income tax was passed, our population has gone up 2% and state spending's gone up over 200%. That's insupportable. And we can, you know, we can talk all day about, yes, you know, the legislature, various governors dropped the ball by not funding, you know, making the, the requirements, required funding of the pension plans. And we've had very generous, you know, um, employee packages. But one of the attractions of Connecticut in those years over places like New York and New Jersey was that we had no income tax. And I, if, if we had passed the income tax and we had the best schools in the country across the state and we had the best roads in the country and amazing infrastructure, then maybe you could say it was worth it. But we have continued to hemorrhage people. We've continued to hemorrhage jobs. We had two of the highest income tax increases in Connecticut history, and yet we're still the only state in New England that hasn't regained the jobs it lost in the recession. So do I know exactly how he's going to do it? No. Do I think it's an admirable goal? Yes. And do I think we can find significant savings in our budget? Absolutely. Um, one of the pieces of um, legislation that was included uh, allowed public hearings to bring in com um, commissions, committees, and the state auditors. So I've been able to attend two of those. One was for higher education and employment advancement, and the other one was yesterday with the Department of Economic and Community Development. And I know with the one with the um, Depart um, higher education, they had two pieces. One was a community college piece, and one addressed basically the Board of Regents. And in 2010, the legislature directed well, I don't even know, was it the Board of Regents back then? Whoever was running the state university system and Charter Oak to develop a centralized purchasing platform you know, on the theory that if you're buying, you know, 100,000 reams of paper from Staples, you get a much better deal than if you're buying. As of 2018, it still had not happened. And one of the questions I asked the comptroller yesterday was, you know, how, how do we make sure that this does happen? The, um, another issue that came up was uh, uh, at the community college level, student parking fines are supposed to be put into a fund to pay for student scholarships. At one of the community colleges, they were using that money to buy Amazon gift cards to reward employees. I mean, th those are just a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at um, you know, the recent uh, prescription drug fraud with $11 million that the comptroller and the AG discovered. I, uh, a colleague told me that they had approached a major um, state government department about implementing zero-based budgeting, and the commissioner agreed, and the governor and the head of OPM overruled this person. Now, for a lot of people, let's try zero-based. Let's see, start from the bottom, and then build the costs in, as opposed to we can't possibly ask for ask for less than last year. So I do think there are savings that can be made. I know one of the recommendations of the uh, Commission on Fiscal Stability and Economic Competitiveness was 
to hire a consultant to look at both how we could best restructure the tax code and find, I think, a billion dollars in savings. I think that's doable. Yeah, um, they, they, in addition to the billion dollars of savings, looking at the projected deficits uh, into the future, that, that commission um, agreed that reducing the AM tax would be a good idea, it, it make the state more competitive uh, with other states. <clears throat> but they said, um, well, you're going to have to find some revenue elsewhere. They, they suggested the sales tax, uh, more controversially, a payroll tax. Um, are you open to tax reform or uh, do tax increases, uh, tax I, adjustments off the table? What, what's your well, I, I think we have to look at reform, and I think we can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. As I say, if raising income taxes were the answer, we wouldn't be in the hole we're in. And until we've tried all the other options, and I mean all the other options, I would not entertain new tax increase. Prove to me that we have exhausted the other possibilities first. Mm -hmm. um, because again, one of the th things everyone mentions is predictability and stability. And this constant, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, oh, that didn't work, so now we're trying this and now we're trying that. What was it last month I read edible arrangements, started here in Connecticut, moving to Georgia. I, I mean, we can't keep doing this, so let's try something different. Uh, you start off by talking about making the sausage, and uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think uh, one of the also another recommendation from that uh, committee uh, was on uh, merging appropriations and expenditures. So, uh, a sort of ways and means committee. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, and I know Senator from me has talked about this that we operate in these uh, silos, parallel paths, and you know, never the twain shall meet. Again, let's, what is it, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I think everybody agrees Connecticut has so much going for it. You know, we've got a beautiful state. We're ideally placed between two major metropolitan areas. We have, you know, robust higher education system. Uh, yeah, all those good things. But we still struggle. So let's let's give it you know give it a shot. See what the things that some people think may have caused us to have these issues, and and look at different alternatives. So yes, you you would be open as part of kind of looking at the, oh, the legislature oh. can approve. Yes. Way to, yeah. Okay. Karen, you wanna anything? Uh, so I noticed that you had received um, recognition from Safe Futures. Yes. Um, congratulations. Thank on you. That. Would you talk about a little bit about your work on behalf of um, victims of domestic violence and anything that you think um, could be further uh, improved? Sure. Uh, I think we passed some, some great legislation in terms of the sort of, what was it, they call it dual offenders. Police were automatically say, but you're both at, you know, you're both at fault, I have to arrest both of you, and it gives them a bit more discretion in determining these. And I also think, as I said on the floor, it's not, women and men are victims of domestic violence, so we have to do everything we can to protect them. Uh, I worked very hard um, <clears throat> with uh, the whole mental health issue. Uh, in fact, when I left the school security safety um, and a school safety working group this morning, we've been looking at the um, SB 1160 and everything that happened post Sandy Hook, and everybody thinks the, the you know the gun measures, but the two really yeah, the other two measures were school security, physically hardening schools, so you can't you know it, you make it very difficult for someone to get in, and to that end, I'm really pleased that the bonding commission approved another 10 million for that because I know East Lyme intends to apply for it in their new school renovation project, um, which we, I was thrilled to help secure the funding for. At the elementary schools, they're implementing all those security recommendations. But the third piece, and I think the most important piece, is mental health. Because whether you're looking at the tragedies, atrocities that are school shootings, whether you're looking at the fact that equally tragic is is the fact that 
these young men and women are far more likely to have a classmate take his or her own life. I know we had a school superintendent talk to us and he said, yes, yeah, since Sandy Hook, I think it was four or five of his high school students had taken their own lives. Um, and I, you know, I know Ann Daigle very well and the, her Brian, Brian's Healing Hearts Foundation. Um, and you know, with your work on addiction, again, if you look at addiction as a way of self-medicating, if you address mental health and funding for mental health, um, I was at the CRAC meeting last week and they said they were happy to receive 16.7 million from the federal government to combat opioid addiction, but 3.3 .3 million for mental health. We, ne we need to address really the terrible scourge that is mental health now, get away from the stigma, and recognize the problems early. Um, Scarlett Lewis was there this morning, um, and she started a foundation after her son was killed at Sandy Hook in his memory. And it's bringing social emotional learning to public schools. And when the governor's commission post Sandy Hook came out, yes, the gun enforcement was one piece, but the other two pieces were mental health and social emotional learning. You need to know how to handle life's problems. You need to know that the reaction shouldn't be to strike out and hurt, that you become resilient, that you understand both your emotions and other people's emotions. It was, it was very compelling and some of the um, research she presented. So yes, although I'm, you know, I'm not on a public health committee, I do think that this is an area that I, I have tried to be involved with and you know promoting legislation on the floor that addresses that. But yes, getting back to you know I I'm fortunate um, the president of Safe Futures is a very dear friend and we've actually been talking to them at the museum about doing programs so we could bring uh, mothers and their children in when no one else is in the museum so they could have a safe space in which to play and just be kids. Very nice. And, and uh, Paul and I earlier had discussed, you have a terrible, um, some safety issues um, on your stretch of the highway. <sighs> yes, yes. Well, you know, and it, it get, gets back to transportation funding. Um, my caucus put forward the prioritized progress, um, which would reserve, um, keep the, all the special transportation bonds, allocate some additional general obligation bonds, and uh, also um, bring back the transportation strategy board. But if, I mean, if we're going to look at funding for transportation, I would like to see attention paid. I was doing, you know, doors in Salem this weekend and the question of Route 85. I mean, I still get the questions, is Route 11 ever, you know, going to be finished? But yes, let's let's do what we can on Route 85. I don't think 11 is on the on the board. And as you know, that our stretch of 95 in Flanders East Lime is among the most dangerous in the state. And I would rather see money put into that, to be frank, than I know rail is wonderful, but $46 a ride subsidy for Shoreline East. I have a constituent who, who contacts me two or three times a year telling me that the six o'clock train that goes by his house and he knows because he hears the whistle is always empty. So you, you, you feel that <clears throat> that's just not supportable, that's not sustainable with that kind of subject given I, the ridership? I, I think if we're going to do that, I, I think it's a question of mm -hmm. you know needs versus wants. Mm -hmm. And I think we really need to fix 95. <laughs> so. um, big divide between the parties on tolls. Uh, yes. Um, the, uh, the Democrats, certainly Governor Malloy, with his $10 million authorization to study, it feels. There's no other sufficient revenue source. Without that, you don't improve the roads as and, and other trans stations necessary. The Republicans have argued that um, that there are other means short of having to put tolls on our highways. Can you talk about that? Well, yes. Yeah. So I, I will admit the vast majority, again, of people I speak to are opposed to tolls. You do find some who are in favor. One, I think we have to look at how we spend our transportation dollars. We have the highest administrative costs in the country. I know, was it five or six years ago, 
the federal government freed up some additional highway money, but the stipulation was it had to be for shovel-ready projects, and at that point, the only projects that were shovel-ready in Connecticut were bike paths. That's not good. Uh, I think if we're going to put tolls in, we need a better plan than proposed 72 gantries and tolls on 95, 84, 91, 2, well, and I suppose I'm looking at this as well. It might not affect us that much in this part of the state because people don't use 95 to hop on and off the way they do in the western part of the state. But let's say you're a small businessman. And we had the commissioner come in and talk to us. And he said, you can't do border tolls because of the agreement we had with the federal government when we took the tolls out. We're in a pilot project that would allow congestion pricing. So between you know six and nine in the morning, you pay $5 and the rest of the day you pay three. Let's suppose you're a small business in Fairfield County and you're, you have five vans, you're a plumber, something like that, and you're hopping on and you're hopping off, and all of a sudden you're spending you know, 20, 30, 40 dollars a day. Additionally, at the end of the week, that's you know, five, 200 dollars a week. You put a real burden on that business, and you put a burden on the, the average individual who may be hopping on and off. And 70% of the tolls would be paid by people who live here. So, so I are yeah. you, so are you open minded to the idea of I would I would again I would have to see the compelling the really compelling argument that there is no other way let, let, give it, you know this is what we want to do and again it, you know the the argument over the New Britain Hartford busway is done it's built but I have yet to see any statistics from the Department of, of Transportation about how many cars it's actually taken off the road I know now all Connecticut University students pay $20 a year and they can ride for free. I don't remember that being the rationale for building that busway at that high cost. So I, prove to me that there is no other way to fund what we need to do and I will listen to your argument, but until you have, and until you prove to me that we're spending money in the smartest way possible, then I'm going to continue to be a skeptic. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> two big planks in, in, the, in the Democratic platform, and we'll ask your, your opponent, he's actually in next, I think, right? And he's here, by the way. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, is a, a family leave and a, and a 15 a dollar minimum wage, um, you know, how, how do you see those? Well, I, th I think the bill that was presented in the last session was absolutely, it was going to be bankrupt in a couple of years. It provided, you could take family medical leave every year, the contribution made by employees was tiny, and it, the way it was laid out after that, the state would be on the hook for making up the difference. And as a small employer, uh, the burden that places on me. Now, I will say, you know, and people will poo-poo the, uh, the federal tax reform, um, but one, businesses that have more money because they're not paying it to the federal government are better able to support their employees. I mean, there were a number of businesses in Connecticut that you know, raised their minimum wage automatically to $15 an hour increase their contribution to 401k plans. Uh, one of the, there's a great piece, and I think it's a Bloomberg piece. This is what, bit Bloomberg, this is what record low unemployment looks like in America. And they took Portland, Maine, Ames, Iowa, and Marietta, Georgia. And because employment is so robust, companies are having to pay not only $15 minimum wage, they're picking up 100% of health care costs. One of them instituted every five years, everybody gets a month-long sabbatical. If you have a vibrant economy, businesses to compete have to offer higher wages and paid family and medical leave. I mean, you look at um, Silicon Valley, where they have very generous benefits. One, they're making money a hand over fist, and two, to retain good people, they have to do that.
But absent the kind of vibrant economy that puts more money in businesses' pockets, how, how, do, you, how do you justify that? And if you say, all right, we're going to do it nationally, then explain to people, okay, this is going to cost something. Are you willing to have X percentage taken out of your paycheck, an additional payroll tax or something? There, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Have, if you want to have universal health care, let's have the conversation. If, if the statistics that it's going to cost $32 trillion are correct, oh, Europe does it. Yes, Europe has higher income tax rates, and they also have a 25% VAT. And if you look at some place like the UK, which is a true single-payer system, I, I, I lived there for 12 years. My younger son, uh, older son, was born on the National Health, actually in the same hospital as Prince William, five years apart, and I was in the National <laughs> Health wing, and they were in the private wing. But for routine care, it's great. But if you're like my husband, who at age 62, before he died, was waiting for a kidney, he wouldn't have been on the list there. If you have a very premature baby, I'm sorry, it's going to cost too much. It comes with rationing. If we're going to institute these social benefits, then let's be honest with people about what it's going to mean. If a $15 minimum wage means McDonald's gets rid of every one of their cashiers, that you order at a kiosk, that you pay with your smartphone, how does that help? If you look at youth employment, if you have to pay 15, and it's not just $15 an hour, it's $15 an hour plus the employer's FICA, and then if you put your starting employees up to that, what do you do further up the scale? Uh, one of the employers at the um, Eastern Workforce Investment Board, I said, well, what would this do to you? They have a pre-apprenticeship program. They pay $13 an hour. They're there for 18 or 24 weeks. They go up to $18 an hour, and a year they're paying $24 an hour. He said, I hire fewer apprentices. So again, businesses that are doing well pay that minimum wage. And if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, I think it's something like only 2 or 3% of households in America are relying solely on one minimum wage job. And the answer to that is, one, better business climate, and two, better training. It shouldn't be, this is my job and that's going to be it. It should be, this is my stepping stone. And again, businesses should work to create those greater skills to promote people. You, I, everybody who comes in whom I employ, please God, let, let you take my job someday. <laughs> anyway, so that, that does that answer your question it about those? <laughs> it does. We have to wrap up because we want to give everyone the same. Okay, uh, same, I, I, I would just, you know, can I, okay. I, I would be incredibly honored to be returned to Hartford. I've worked very hard in this session. In addition to having a full-time job and five children and a 92-year-old father, I, I didn't miss a single vote. As you mentioned, I was um, honored by the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence. I introduced a bill that was passed. I worked on the Pay Equity Working Group and helped with that legislation that prevented asking about prior employment history that was able to help women. I've done over 150 events in my district, from Board of Selectmen meetings to Board of Ed meetings, uh, again, attending regional meetings like the Eastern Workforce Investment Board. I'm very proud. Obviously, I expected Mark Nickerson to endorse me, but I'm incredibly proud that Kevin Lydon, the first Selectman of Salem, is choosing to endorse me. And I'm, I'm humbled that I was elected, but I feel I have more work to do on mental health, on protecting our children, on making sure Connecticut is a place in which everyone can work and live. Thank you. Thank you.